and this is possible. Is that why you deleted and, Twitter? Why? Well, yeah, yeah, it's off my phone. <laughs> yes. Um, so you haven't deleted your account? Have you? No, Just I'm still on Twitter, but I, I, I will, uh, based on this recent episode, I will I use it differently. I am fascinated by people and their struggles with social media, yeah. with like de detaching from it, reattaching from it, getting addicted to it. I mean, I know so many people that will look at their Twitter at like one o'clock in the morning before they go to bed and something pisses them off and then they can't sleep. Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. Well, it's really I, common. I, I was not... I, I, I don't consider myself someone who had a, a, a real pathology with it. I mean, I was, you know, I, I have, I don't know, six thousand tweets or seven thousand tweets over the course of, over the many years. Um, so I'm not. I was not tweeting that much. I was not even looking that much. I was. I was fairly uh, disengaged. And I've never used Facebook as a. I've never. I just use Facebook as kind of a publishing channel. I never engage with comments. But I was looking enough, and it. It was, I mean, one, it was clearly making me a worse person. I mean, I just, it was, I was, I was reacting to stuff that I didn't need to react to. And it was amplifying certain criticisms and, and voices, which need not have been amplified. And in this, in this last case, it just turned a, I mean, it just it created a, a, a huge kind of a, a explosion in my life. I was in the middle of a vacation, which I basically mm. torpedoed because of what I saw on Twitter. I mean, it was just, it was like the, the perfect infomercial for why you don't want to be engaged you with social media. You torpedoed your vacation how? Well, so I'm in the middle of, like, the first vacation I've taken with my family for in a very long time. It was at least a year. And, wow. And we're, so, I, we're, you know, we're on Hawaii, and just, like, I'm supposed to put everything down to be the best father and husband I can be, right? And, and that was my intention. That's what was happening. Uh, it happened for a good solid 24 hours, <laughs> <laughs> and and then I pick up my phone and I see that that Reza Aslan and Glenn Greenwald and Ezra Klein had all attacked me in the space of an hour. Oh right? no! And so now, this is like now it's, this goes out to millions of people. And, and is I, this over the what he was also was asking about the Charles Murray thing? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, truth is, I can't even see what I, I didn't look at what Greenwald had done. Um, he was circulate in somebody's video about me how I'm I think I'm a racist in that video Rez Aslan blocks me so I can't even see what if he attacks me by name but he blocks me so, yeah. they, so I can't even see what his, <laughs> his export yeah. but uh, so I, I so, but I just saw the the aftermath of that you know lots of stuff you know lots of notifications coming to me with both of us tagged um, and then Ezra published this I mean, I suppose I should back up uh, however painfully, to, to describe what happened here. But So I had Charles Murray on my podcast a year ago, and Charles Murray is this, this um, social scientist who uh, published The Bell Curve back in the 90s, which it was a, a book about IQ and, and success in, in Western societies like our own. And uh, uh, it's a book where he worries a lot about the, the cognitive stratification of society. We have a society that is selecting more and more for a narrow band of, of talents, that are is very well, fairly well captured by what we call IQ, and there is, is a kind of winner-take-all situation where people are really, you know, 500 years ago, if you had a a very high IQ and you're, you're just pushing a plow next to your neighbor, you had no real advantage. But now you can start a hedge fund or you can start a software company, and we're we're seeing the, this this real uh, shocking disparity <clears throat> in in uh, good fortune, really. Uh, so. Uh, he wrote this book. It had a, a chapter on race, which talked about the disparities in, in, in r racial uh, groups. Uh, the statistically it, observed yeah. disparities. Right. Yeah. And uh, the claim about the source of those disparities was by even the standards of the time, but certainly the, the standards of today, an incredibly tepid, mealy-mouthed, just hand-waving. It was not this you know, here comes the Third Reich declaration of, of white supremacy. It was undoubtedly there are environmental and genetic reasons for this, and we don't understand them. You know, it was just, it was just like to, to think that it's one or the other, we're not in a position to know what the mix is of, of, of influences now. Um, and that is uh, virtually any honest scientist's take on the matter. Um, and to, certainly today, I mean, it's, it's only become more so. Uh, but that went off like a nuclear bomb. I mean, that was just, so, that was such a, um, uh, I mean, it's, it's the most, 
I, so at, and at the time, I never read the book. I just thought this had mm. to be just racist. And of course, poison. Charles Murray would be vilified for for that observation. And he he's yeah. been vilified ever since. And ever mm. since, you know, I've ignored him. Wasn't he deplatformed and mm. assaulted recently? Yeah. So that's what happened. Yeah. So so he went to Middlebury to give a talk. You know, twenty uh, some odd years, twenty five years after he wrote this book. Oh, by the and, way, he's also listed by the Southern Poverty Law Center. Uh, oh. and, and so that that that's what contributed to the deplatforming and the violent protest against him at Middlebury. What's crazy right. is the whole thing is a propaganda for the superiority of the Asian race, and everyone's yeah. missing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's the flip side of it. Yeah. 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 They're all talking about white supremacy. And it Asian says Asians are actually are ones are far and above. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's basically what his book proved. And you know, they're suing Harvard now. There's a group right. of Asian students that are su suing Harvard because they're discriminated against yeah. because they're required to have higher scores yeah. because they're assumed to be smarter. So wow. the standards for Asian students entering into Harvard is higher than white people. Wow. Yes. Well, Asian privilege. It's a, it's a big problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, your, your grandfather was working on the railroads in California as an, an indentured servant, and, and yeah. uh, all that privilege trickled down. There's obviously a lot of factors that lead to IQ, to, to high IQ, but to ignore what those are, to ignore it completely, to just bury in the name your head of, in the In the name of ideology, of course. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Only ideology. Yeah. And the, this idea that you cannot look at statistics, you cannot look at facts. Mm. And w in your conversation with Ezra Charles, that's what, or Ezra Klein, rather, that's what I got is that this is, this is an ideological issue, and that you, you, it's almost like an impossible subject to breach. Yeah. Like you can't even discuss the fact that certain races demonstrate low IQ, and then let's look at what could be the cause of those. Even discussing that somehow or another is so inherently racist that it must be ignored or must be silenced and that you, you must first concentrate on all the various injustices that have been done to those people who have this lower IQ. Yeah. Well, let me just take a couple of minutes to close the various doors to hell that are now ajar <laughs> based on what we've just said. Uh, so, so you were on your holiday, yeah. and you get all oh, these notes. Yeah, yeah. so, so but we'll just take a little more context. So, so, yeah, as you said, Charles Murray went to Middlebury College and was deplatformed, and he was not only deplatformed, so the usual deplatforming with mm. the students turning their back to the speaker yeah. and shouting and not letting anything happen, but... The professor who invited him, who was a liberal professor who wanted to essentially debate him. She was wanted, attacked. Yeah. Yeah. When they're leaving the hall, they both get physically attacked by a, 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 a crowd of students. Charles was, was not hurt. His host, uh, this female professor, got a concussion and a neck injury that, that still persists. And this is now more than a year later. So like she, she was actually I think actually she's a registered uh, Democrat. By this. No <laughs> doubt. And and they're driving out in an SUV where that gets, I mean, someone pulls a, a stop sign out of the, the, the sidewalk and it's still got the concrete ball on the end of it and that this SUV gets smashed with this, you know, concrete-laden stop sign. I mean, this was this is happening at one of the most liberal, privileged colleges on earth. Uh, it's nuts. So anyway, that was the thing that put Murray on my radar after all these many years of my ignoring him. And I had actually, and I felt guilty because I had declined to be a part of at least one project because his name was attached, right? Because I just thought, this guy's radioactive. He's, he's got some white supremacist agenda. I had believed the, 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 the lies about him. Uh, and then I saw this and I thought, okay, well, maybe he's the canary in the coal mine or, or certainly one of the canaries in the coal mine that I had ignored where, the, as you say, there are these certain topics are considered so politically fraught that you cannot discuss them no matter what is true. Like, mm -hmm. uh, it's like it's just a, you know, uh, there has to be a firewall between your conversation about reality and these sorts of facts. Uh, and so, you know, so he's been, uh, you know, suffering from having transgress that boundary and so i had him on the on the podcast uh being fairly agnostic about his his actual social policy commitments and his political uh, concerns and just wanting to talk about uh you know the, the facts insofar as we touch them lightly i mean i had zero interest in intelligence uh, as measured by iq uh although yeah, i mean it's an interesting subject but i hadn't you know i hadn't spent much time focused on that and I had uh, truly zero interest in establishing differences between populations with respect to intelligence or anything else. But I see what's coming. I see the fact that, that the, the more we understand ourselves, genetically and environmentally, the more we will, if we go looking, or even if we're not looking, we will discover differences between groups. And the end game for us as a species is not to deny that those differences exist or could possibly exist. It's to 
deny that they have real political implication. I mean, the, the, the political impl- the, the political framework we need is a commitment to to equality across the board and a, a commitment to treating individuals as individuals. There's nobody who's a, the, the average of a population is meaningless with respect to you, mm. and that will always be so. And um, and whatever you know, and, and whatever diversity of talents there is statistically in various populations, we want societies that simply don't care politically about that. I mean, that, that's just—it's just not what it's. The our, our political tolerance of one another and support of one another is not predicated on denying individual differences or even statistical differences across groups. It can't be because we know that there are people walking around like, uh, you know, Elon Musk, who gets out of bed in the, every morning and does the work of like 4,000 people, right? And people who just are, are struggling to work at Starbucks and hold down a job. And our political system, I mean, this, we, we don't say one person is more valuable politically and socially than another, even though one person's capable of doing massive things that that that, that uh, many most other people aren't. It's you know when it comes time to to write laws and create institutions that protect that that support human flourishing, we we have to engineer tides that raise all the boats. And so you know and and you know there are legitimate debates about the social policies that will do that, but and there are legitimate debates about facts. So we can debate scientific fact. And and you know the the results of you know psychometric testing or or behavioral genetics that are relevant to this question of intelligence, uh, and we can have a good faith debate about the data, and then we can have a good faith debate about social policy that should follow from the data. But what's happening on the left now is on either at either of those t- t- tiers of conversation, there are just straight up allegations of, of, of racism that hit you the <clears> moment <throat> you touch certain uh, certain can, facts. Can right? I say